I ask Cesare to go for a, a very interesting challenge for all of us, which is a challenge for patients on long-term systemic treatments. Your talk, Cesare. Okay, thank you, Alain. Uh, at first, I would like to thank the uh, organizing committee and uh, KCA for inviting me to that meeting to Dublin and say uh, that we d I got the challenge uh, to find out, find out the data with uh, long-term uh, systemic therapy, and I offer you a bit of optimism. Uh, contrary to the picture, which, I mean, look a bit uh, dramatic, the situation of that lonely tree, and uh, say that, uh, to state that uh, uh, there are some data supporting that, that uh, optimism. So, at first, we do have a lot of questions uh, speaking about the challenges. So at first, how long is the long treatment? Then uh, which drug to choose to obtain a long-term response? What prognosis to expect and how to manage toxicity? And my colleagues already did it uh, because overcoming the toxicities means to make possible patients to be long-term patient. So how long to treat? The next very important uh, question. And finally, how to cover the cost of the long-term treatment. So uh, uh, the first question about what means the long-term uh, uh, patients and long-term therapy, we have at first to look at the main run randomized uh, phase three trials. And as you can follow the PFS data, uh, you see that the values are starting from four to uh, 11 months and looking on the overall survival, you can observe that it starts from 10 up to 28 months. So to me, it was obvious that uh, the long term should be uh, longer than uh, 30 months. And uh, I uh, agree that uh, uh, 36 months should, should be the, the, the proper time for estimating as a long term. So uh, what are the biomarkers? We are speaking about the ECOC, about the MSKCC, the tumor burden, about HIF, uh, VGF, CMAT, PBMR1, and mTOR. And Tom Hudson stated already that they do have a data that the missense mutation in mTOR and TSU1 may be predicting the response and the long-term response for patients uh, exposed to the uh, tamsirolimus mTOR inhibitors. But usually in our practice, what do we observe in clinic, that we have three group of responses, the primary refractory, the early progressors, and then the most important for us, the group of late progressor. So we are speaking about timing of response, and is it significant? <clears throat> and watching the data we have from Molnand and, and and the Mozart uh, publications. On the left side, you can see the non-responders, uh, PFS and overall survival. And uh, what you can see that uh, the differences are really striking. Same for those who've been uh, late responders. Also, they uh, uh, behave better, uh, the, uh, 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 better the late responders were than the, the elderly responders. So also important in decision-making process is how to choose the first line. Uh, usually it's the most important because the longest responses they are after the uh, first line and then the decision of, uh, of the second line scenario for the long-term response. Do we have other tools? I guess they are not uh, uh, mm, useful in predicting the long term. These are uh, the, the table you see here and the publications uh, from European Journal of Cancers is about decision making and choosing the, uh, the drug in a proper moment, but it does not help predicting on the long term uh, uh, mm, response. So we also know from the large retrospective European cooperative series that uh, in those patients who have had a clear cut and long lasting benefit uh, from a first line TKI, no significant PFS differences were observed in a second line, irrespective of the agent used. 
So this is probably due by the fact that the uh, RCC is so heavily dependent on angiogenesis, inhibiting mTOR ultimately results in a continuous event for indirect inhibition of angiogenesis. So the question, the next one, is, is the dosing important for the long-term treatment? And we have uh, double two, double positive uh, uh, answers that, uh, as you see here, uh, there is uh, uh, influence of the uh, proper uh, uh, and the concentration of sunitinib. And we have also Sergio Bracar's stu study, which is suggesting and uh, bringing the very uh, optimistical news that uh, the 2-1 uh, dosing is better than 4-2. Four, uh, four so <clears throat> how to keep the long-term treatment? Uh, 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 it, it was presented by, uh, by, by former speakers, especially Manuela and, uh, um, and Sergio. But uh, what about the risk factors among those patients who uh, are living longer and are under the long-term treatment? And it was found and it was published uh, recently that the only patients uh, with uh, negative prediction, they are patients with the uh, lung metastasis. So uh, uh, how the long-term treatments uh, tolerate uh, the treatment, the toleration is quite good. At, is, as you see, there are very few grade three or grade four uh, uh, side effects. But I told at the beginning that I got a challenge to find out the data in literature speaking about the, uh, the long-term uh, patients and their therapy. So uh, we decided to take a look in the, our database in Military Institute of Medicine in Warsaw, and we got one, more than 150 patients, and these are patients who are outside the uh, uh, sunitinib uh, registration trial, and the therapy started in January 2007 up to uh, December 2011, and the data cut off was in December 2013. As you see, we have uh, 170 male and 36 female. And as what is important as the uh, dose reduction uh, reason to 37 was mainly hematologic and, uh, and arrhythmia. And usually the treatment contains sunitinib everolimus, which is only allowed the second line treatment uh, um, until the end of 2013. So, uh, uh, looking on the termination uh, of the therapy, usually it was the progression in 87% of patients. So we did have one, uh, 153, but as you can see at the bottom, we have still 36 on therapy, which is approximately 20% of patients who are treated with this uh, drug. So the termination was among 117, uh, followed by Everolimus and you see how many of them are still in the therapy, 21. So if we can take a look on the first and second line PFSs in our, in our institute, you can see that uh, for the first line uh, sunitinib, the median PFS was 16 uh, months, and for Everolimus as the second line was 7.7. Uh, as you know from the clinical trial, it was the median was uh, uh, described as a 4.9. So there was no correlation between the sunitinib uh, everolimus, uh, but if we could take a look on the uh, side effects, most of them, they been same as the uh, phase three uh, data from clinical trials. So uh, the same, I mean, laboratory and the clinical one, but what is uh, striking, there is a difference between the record trial uh, on Everolimus following the sunitinib and the data we do have, especially uh, as you can see the fatigue in the clinical trial was 6% in, and in our experience 15%. Uh, also <clears throat> the stomatitis 3% and in our experience 19 Asthenia 2.4% and in our data, 13%. What about the lab data? Uh, same, uh, the differences of grade three. As you can see, the anemia was close to nine in the record and 36 in our experience, same lip, uh, with lymphopenia, 
there are no da data about neutropenia and thrombocytopenia in that study. So uh, uh, again, uh, our uh, experience is that the Everolimus is much more toxic than in the record, record trial. So looking on the overall survival of, of our group, that uh, uh, after the uh, nephrectomy, the media, median is 87 months. The three-year survival, uh, uh, we have 72%, and for the five-year survival, 57 And since sunitinib treatment start, we see that the median is 29 months, and three-year survival, we do have among 42 patients. We've been also looking for the subgroup analysis, uh, looking for the, uh, some prognostic factors. We find that uh, sunitinib-induced uh, hypothyroidism, uh, sunitinib-induced uh, 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 hypertension, diabetes, uh, uh, BMI, uh, calcium, and creatinine, they can be in univariate analysis uh, important. But if we take a look on the multivariate analysis, for the first four look uh, really important for that group of, a, of patients. So this is the summary for that group. So we do have overall and five-year survival of patients is about three times longer than prior to the introduction of isunitinib, and the PFS on sunitinib is statistically higher than in a phase three clinical trials, is 4.9 months in difference. Sunitib induced hypertension and hypothyroidism are positive predictive factors. Diabetes is negative predictive factor in this combination, and BMI is a positive predictive factor for the same uh, combination. And right now, because it was only at 150 patients, we decided to ask for the first time the National Health Fund to open the database for our analysis. So they do have uh, patients registered for vet therapy, and since 2010, we do have a therapeutic healthcare programs, uh, uh, which was possible to reimburse the treatment. And uh, as, uh, truly uh, speaking, the uh, inclusion criteria <coughs> to receive the reimbursement in Poland is, is much uh, stringent than in the phase three trial. And uh, as Bernard comment, uh, the situation in Italy, we also sadly have the same group of people. And as a, an example is that fact that we have, if we have a long-term uh, uh, responders, we have to do every three months uh, computed tomography. So uh, the analysis was possible for the sunitinib since January 2010 from uh, surafenib from uh, two years later and same for Everolimus. And uh, uh, we do have uh, two databases uh, for this retrospective analysis to assess the outcomes. And uh, um, one is called SMPT, and the another one is called KLP. The KLP database is the reimbursement system for all of the patients with IDs included in the program and the dates are the start of the treatment, end of the treatment, date of the death. And in opposite, the SMPT database is the clinical monitoring system. We do have all patients, the dates, the start of the treatment, end of the treatment, date of the first diagnosis, date of the death as an option, cause of the treatment stop, and tumor resistant uh, response, are we using a resist, adverse event assessment, and MSKCC risk factors. So in our database, we did have, I mean, in a National Health Fund database, we did have nearly 2,500 patients on sunitinib, more than 650 on Everolimus, and more than 200 on, on serafenib. And it was a KLP and an SMPT. We did have more than 2,000 patients on sunitinib, 400 on Everolimus, and 150. So finally, for the long-term analysis patients with, I mean, all of the data for the PFSs, we did have 1,400 patients. So we, what is the PFS uh, for the whole population? The, whole, uh, the PFS is 12.7 months. The, for Everolimus is 5.2. And the overall su survival on Everolimus is too early to draw the data and uh, conclusion because it's too early. 
For sunitinib therapy initiated, the median overall survival is 27.6, and sunitinib followed by everolimus is 36.7. But uh, uh, we've been looking also for adverse events among the long-term survivors, and as you see here, they are gradually decreasing, and we do have really a small amount of the serious side effects in that group of followed patients. So what about the long-term survivors? Is the clue of the, uh, uh, that analysis. We did have 20, 242 patients, and uh, those SMPT, 227. So uh, mainly male and uh, only 30 uh, female. And the progression-free survival for gr this group of patients is more than 42 months. And looking on the adverse events along uh, the uh, time of observation, you see that the tendency is decreasing. So what do we learn from this treatment? And that we know that long-term treatment may be referred as to overall survival over 38 months and total, uh, total time uh, of uh, sequencing failure is uh, above 20 months. So long-term exposure to sunitinib has encouraging efficacy in the treatment of uh, clear cell RCC and sunitinib treatment, uh, the uh, sunitinib because that uh, group of patients was uh, so, I mean, uh, mature to that analysis. Treatment uh, with that compound unable to achieve long-term response in a subset of patients with metastatic RCC. Lack of bone metastasis or lung metastasis and good MSKCC risk status may predict long-term response, and the health-related quality of life of long-term survivors warrants uh, greater attention. So the finally, the last slide, what uh, the problem we have really to face today. In a National Health uh, Found database, approximately, depending on the which uh, database we are using, 10 to 20 percent sunitinib patients are uh, recognized as long-term survivors. Don't, so the cost of one year per patient is 200,000 Polish lotis. Uh, the equation you have here, on one euro is around four. So three years uh, per 600,000 makes 120 million zlotys for those who are surviving three years. But in our uh, uh, database, we do have not only one. We have a couple of patients who are surviving from the beginning of the sunitinib trial nine years. So one patient cost the system 1,800,000. It's close to a half a million euro. So the question uh, for the academic trial is, please uh, analyze, is it possible to stop the treatment? And uh, this way, maybe not only uh, uh, cutting the prices of the treatment and make possible for novel target agents to be reimbursed, but also it's about the patient's quality of life. So finally, I will thank to my uh, military institute uh, team uh, for the excellent work and support, Dr. Anna Czarnecka, Marcin Świerkowski, Przemek Langiewicz, and the uh, National Helephone team with Zbigniew Teter, Tomasz Czeleko, and Andrzej Śliwczyński. Dear colleagues, thank you for your attention.